then. Psalm 53. Psalm 53. Last time we made it through a whole verse. So we'll see what happens this time. Now, what is the, uh, the psalm that is so similar to Psalm 53? Which one is it? You remember? Close. 14. Close enough. You'd find it quick if you went there. And there, it, the, um, the similarities are so close. Basically, you've got two verses that are kind of combined into one verse, and that's the whole difference. The other ones, it is almost word for word, and you have to ask, you know, why, why is it that God does this? Why does he give us the same psalm? We got to say, well, probably because we need it twice, and he knows what we need. And so this psalm, what it does is it gives us uh, a very descriptive look at the biblical version of a fool. Now, I should have asked this a minute ago. Does anyone need a handout? We can get you one. One, two. Al, can you grab those? Uh, four. They're showing this back table. Practical atheist. Or practical atheism. Go ahead and put your hands back up if you need one. So this is uh, same as last week. Okay. So we're looking at the biblical version of a fool. So what I'm going to do is go over real quickly uh, the first few points, and then we're going to get started into the new text, the new part of it. Okay, so the first thing we looked at is the folly of fools, the folly of fools. And what this, verse one, let's just go ahead and read this together. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Corrupt are they and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that does good. So really, if you, if you narrow it all down, a fool is somebody that lives as though God doesn't exist. And that's easy to see with an unsaved person. It's easy to see that you know, their mindset is, you know, it doesn't matter what he, what God, even if they believe in a God, it doesn't matter what he wants. It doesn't matter how he's not interested. I'm just going to do my own thing. So they live as though he doesn't exist. And the problem comes in as well when you have those who would be professing Christians who are living as though God doesn't exist and is doing their own thing. Of all people, those of us who know the Gospels, we're accountable. We are highly accountable for what we know. And it's, it's urgent that we live it. You need a pen. Okay. Okay. So that first point is the folly of fools. Under that, we had the result in relation to self. The result in relation to self. And this has the idea, that first phrase, corrupt are they. Those who are living in this way, they either are going to become a corrupting influence on somebody else, or they're going to live a corrupt life, and usually it's both of them together. They are going to be corrupt. Then we saw the uh, result in relation to God. They've done abominable iniquity or evil. So all of the works that are done are evil, all of them. And and. That's happening because the source of it is evil. There's, there's nothing we can do. And the, the only way that our lives can possibly be not corrupt and bring some kind of glory to God is when we are in Christ. That's it. That's the only righteousness that can possibly happen is us being in Jesus Christ, having him in our lives. Then we saw the result in relation to man. There's none that does good. So the unsaved don't have it in them, if you will, to do good. And when we're living for self, that tendency is to, to put aside the good and only seek others' good when it benefits self. So everything ends up being about self, and there's none that does good, no, not one. I mean, it's just not there. And the only way we can possibly accomplish the good is by being, again, in Christ and having that relationship with him. And that brings us to point two, where we'll start tonight, the number of fools. The number of fools. So let's pray, and we'll look at our text. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for loving us. Lord, I do want to ask tonight for you, Lord, that you would, Lord, just 
Please help ease her pain, comfort her, and help her as she endures just more of this arthritis that's been hitting her. Lord, I just ask for your help. And Lord, help her to, to, to focus on you. And I pray that you would make yourself very real to her. And ask also for Joel Kirby's mom, Pat, that you would uh, heal her. Lord, please raise her from this uh, COVID. And Lord, and with the cancer, allow it to, to go in remission. But Lord, give her the ability to get back on her feet. Lord, I ask as we look into your word, Lord, please help us to understand it. Help it to be clear. Help us to be responsive to it. Lord, I ask for your help as I preach, that you would keep me from error. Help me not to be a distraction to the message you would have preached tonight. And God, in some way, would you please glorify yourself by our time here in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the number of fools. You ever stop and, and wonder, I mean, wherever you're at, and you look around, you know, I wonder how many of these people are actually followers of Jesus. And you just kind of look around. I wonder weird things like this. You know, I wonder how many of these people would even deny the existence of God. How many of these people are just that, that caught up in living for self that they would totally deny him? And then you wonder, you know, you, you look even in the church. Uh, I say church is, you know, as a, as, a, as a body, a whole body. As you look at the church, you know, how many Christians are actually in the process of denying Jesus practically by not living for him. How many of us, how many, we may just say, how many are carnal? And you just look and you wonder, you know, who is really desiring? You look at your own life sometimes. Are we really desiring to live for our Lord? Is that passion there? And sometimes it can get frustrating when you look and you wonder, you know, what's going on in Christianity? It, it is kind of frustrating. But this, this number of fools, when you look at it, that, that's, I want us to just think about these two verses to, uh, for tonight. This, uh, verse number two, let's start there, the search. The search. Verse two says, God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. So he starts out with this, God looked down. That is not the idea. Um, you, may, you may think of you know, angels sitting on a cloud, bad, bad picture, but looking down. Just, you know, happen to see what's going on. This casual glance. That's not the word we have. This is an intense searching look. Now, we've done this. I'm looking around. Most, most of us have glasses. Have you ever repaired your own glasses? And you pull that little bitty screw that's right here out and you drop it. And you, you don't have your glasses anymore because the screw's out. And you're looking for this thing. You're on your hands and knees, especially if you're on carpet. You're just looking for this screw. And I don't know what it is. These screws, whether you know it or not, they're metal, but they're made of rubber. And when they hit the ground, they can bounce a mile. And then you got to go find. You, you see the picture I'm getting at? When you start looking, for, this is the word, when you start looking for that screw, you're, you're intently looking. You're searching for this thing really, really close. And when I was in South Carolina, my, my mom was putting together a puzzle. It was one of those you know, 750 whatever pieces. And, and you go up to it and you start putting the piece in, but you're looking, you're, you're trying to find the piece that matches. And it's just that kind of stuff. You're, you're trying your best to look intently. This is the word for what God is doing. God intently look. And the, the word there means to bend down. And the idea of you know, bending over to look close. God is, he stooped over looking at something very closely. He's desiring to find it. That's the picture we have here of what God is doing or how he's described. So God is intently looking for one, in verse two, who did understand. He wants to find someone, and this is the opposite of a fool, somebody who gets it, somebody who acts wisely. The fool doesn't. The fool does not get it. The fool doesn't act wisely. He's looking for one that sought God, that did seek after God. So what would that refer to? How how do you find, how do you, how would you classify or describe somebody who's seeking after God? And in this case, we're talking about an unsaved person, but it can apply to a saved person. We'll do the apply to a saved person next. But for an unsaved, 
how would you describe somebody who is seeking after God? This isn't the hard one. Okay, asking questions, wanting to know information, that's good. That's good. What else? You ever met, and maybe you were there? Yes. Okay, could be looking for him in a church. We, we know, we, if you remember, when you were an unsaved person, there was, you may not have recognized it at the time, but as you start getting exposed to the gospel, there is less and less peace. There's less you don't have the relationship, and you know, you start getting conviction. You know that you're, you need forgiveness, and there's that seeking of how do I take care of this sin problem? How do I deal with this? This is, a, this is somebody who is desiring a relationship with God. Somehow, they may not know how, they don't get it, but they're, they're desiring it. God is looking for somebody who's searching. He's looking for people who are, who are desiring. And just like we saw with this Ethiopian eunuch this morning, when, when light is given, God keeps giving more light. He keeps helping. And it's, it's, it's not the concept of, you know, I've got to struggle hard. It's, you know, it's people who desire God. God keeps opening their eyes. He keeps working. He's not desiring that any should perish. And so he keeps it, uh, uh, giving more as we seek. But here he's looking for somebody that sought God, sought to make peace with him in some way. Now, we got to understand this because you and I, this breaks down. Those who don't know Christ, as they are, to use that example, as they're coming to a church and they're looking for truth, as they are not responding to that truth, they're more accountable. The more truth we get, the more accountable we are. To whom much is given, much shall be required. We have got a lot of truth that gets given to people, especially in our country still. Truth is given, and people are accountable for the truth that they get. So people, this, this verse is looking, for, looking at people. God is seeing, is there anybody that gets it? Is there anybody that's searching for me? Is anybody on this page, if you will? So it's easy to see with unsafe people. This is not what this verse is referring to, but this same thing can apply with those who are followers of Jesus. Is, are, are there people, are there Christians who are actually searching for God? Are they, is there, it's sometimes you look around and say, is there anybody who's serious minded about following Jesus? Is there anybody who, once they walk out of a church on a Sunday, is there anybody who actually goes out and wants to live for him? Is there anybody that's wanting to make disciples out here? And sometimes it, it, it can get frustrating. Here, God is saying, God looked down on all of the children of men to see if, is there anybody that gets it? Is there anybody that's seeking after me? And that's the picture we have in verse two. So we see the searching, but then we see in verse three, the results of this thing, the results. Let's just read through this. Uh, verse three, every one of them has gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that does good. No, not one. There's one thing that, that really stands out as I look at that verse. The same thing happens over and over. Do you see these inclusive, all-inclusive words that he uses? Every one of them, no exception. They're all together, every one of them. There is none that does good, not one. All of these words are these all-inclusive words. And this is the, this, these are the passages that Paul quotes when he's talking about all of sin and come short of the glory of God. There's none that does good. There is none that seeks after God. These are, the, these are the passages that he's looking back at, that he's quoting. And this applies, it's, it's not just in Israel. It's not just, Paul's not just talking about Israel here. And these verses are talking about, you know, David is a Jew. He's not, it's talking about all of us. It's not just Israel. There is none that seeks after God. There's none that is righteous. All of us are in this same boat. All of us 
are sinners. Now, so we need to realize what, what this means. There were, at that point in time, and the same is true today, there is none that seeks after God. Okay, how, how does this work? If, if nobody seeks after God, then how does anybody come to Jesus? This is just kind of a more of a theological question. I'm not trying to go too deep with it. But yeah. Okay, we come to our end. That's absolutely true. But we don't do the seeking. How does it happen? How? Okay, we got to be told. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by. And how will they hear without preacher? And is that preacher referring to me? No. It's a proclaimer. Anybody. They need to hear. Absolutely. And God uses that. God uses his word in order to. And here's the key. Here's the verse I'm thinking on right now, too. Does, does anyone just wake up one day and say, I want to go to Christ on their own initiative? No. No one can come to the Son except what? The Father draws him. I don't know how that works. But I tell you what, the day that you were understanding and having that, let's call it that urge to want to make peace with God, to want to get forgiveness, God was drawn. That was happening. Did you still have to make a conscious, deliberate choice, et cetera? Yes, I understand that. The point we're looking at is God's got to do that drawing. God is the one who's doing the work. God is the initiator. God is the one who pulls us. And we can be thankful for that. God loved us that much that he, he was willing to, in my rebellion, pull me to himself. That's a loving God. I can't picture doing that. But he did it. And I'm very thankful that our God does the seeking. He does the illuminating. He does the drawing. He does all of this. Now, some people get this idea, and this is the wrong idea. Because God is the one who has to do all of this, What's the use? Why, is it, why do I have to bother? God's going to do it. He's going to do what God's going to do, so I don't need to bother. That's wrong. That is wrong. God is not, and, and how do all these things work together? I don't know, but I, I do know God's not willing that any should perish. We have a choice that we need to make. I get it, but we need to understand as we are in the process of making that choice, God's the one doing the pulling. God's the one that's working, and I, I don't know another phrase to use except behind the scenes. He's the one that can work, and how he works in my mind, I don't get it, but he does. And it's a beautiful picture, and it should cause us gratitude that he's working. And that's a great thing. Absolutely. Exactly. And the, the passage that goes along exactly with that, we're going to see that, well, we'll see it now. The passage that goes along with that so well is, in my flesh dwells some good things. No, zilcho, I mean, there's nothing in my flesh that is good. We're not going to impress God. And then you got to go back to Isaiah, right? Our righteousness, our, our religious, our wonderful works are like what? Is that talking about unbelievers? Well, them too, but Isaiah was a follower. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. There's in my flesh dwells no good. It's all Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to keep bringing our focus back to. God is looking to see if, any, if there's any that sought God and he didn't find a single one because there are none. 
And that's why we can be so grateful that we have this relationship with Christ. Remember the example we saw? Uh, many of you have gone through that exchange and, and we saw the, you know, we put our name and what we've done and he put Jesus' name and what he's done and then Jesus swaps. He makes that exchange for us and we take on his goodness, his perfection. He takes on our sin. That's the picture that we have. We should be extremely grateful for what he's done. How do you know you're grateful? Well, there should be that passion to want to live for him, to want to be yielding to him. There should be a, 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 an outward thankfulness because what Jesus did is he saw the need we had and he did something. About it. Now, that's a weakness, okay? That's a weakness we have. I, I see a lot of times, we can, and I'm talking about myself often with this, we, we see needs, we know this needs to be done. This would be a good thing. This would be a positive thing for us to do. But we don't have that desire to do something about it. We don't act on it. See, that's because we're not passionate about that need. God was passionate. And he rescued us from this bondage that you and I were in. And, and, and not only that, we can see from this, the fact that even with, with believers, unbelievers, we're in the same boat. Only we're redeemed. We are, there's none of us that does good. That should cause us not to be having this downward look at somebody. In that sense, we're, we're equals. There's no fleshly thing we've done that's helped us. There's no fleshly thing the unsaved can do to help them. We, we should be able to have a compassion on them. And if God can save you and I, if he can redeem us and make us followers of Jesus, he can do that with our friends and our neighbors. And that should give us a, more of a passion to go reach them. It should cause us to want to you know, go to somebody and invite them to a Bible study. Invite them to look into the word of God and, and help them. We have the answers to their problems. And we've got it so clearly. So if he can save us, he can save them. Uh, have you met people? I've got, I've got one in my mind right now. You, know, you get it in your mind, this, this idea, and they're just, they're too far gone. I'm not going to waste my time. Have you ever met somebody where you've had that thought? And I'm telling you, that's not a good thought, but that comes through your mind. It's just a waste. I'm not going to waste my time. You, listen, the pastor that led me to Christ, I would have said, you're wasting your time before you know, I came to Christ. It would have been... That there, there wasn't a lot of good things that he, he could have seen to pick from, if you will. This should give us a passion for people because of the grace that God has shown us. Does that make sense? And I, I'm, yes, I'm beating this a little bit, but this is our motivation today for us. And I've been pushing this hard. Let's make disciples. Let's get busy with this process of making disciples. This is why. Because of what he's done for us. And for me, really, it takes away pressure. Sometimes there's that pressure. I've got to say the right things. I've got to have everything. I've got to have all my ducks in a row and everything's got to be perfect. No, everything had to be perfect because we don't do the saving. We just introduce people to Jesus. We're the heralds. We just get to say, here's what God says. Here's what, and let's keep pushing it back to what Jesus says, because that's where I, we're safe with that one. It doesn't matter what we think, but we have a very much uh, an understanding, or we should have, on what these fools are going through, going through, because we've been there, done that. Okay. Anything else on these two verses? Those were good points that you brought up. Anyone else? Okay, let's go ahead to point three, the practice of fools. The practice of fools. So what is it that, a, what does a fool look like in their daily life? And that's what these verses are gonna show us. So think, but I want you to think this, as far as application wise, if this is what characterizes a fool, if things we're gonna see, this is what rejectors of God look like. That should be kind of a, you know, like a red flag for us. I don't want to look like this. I don't want this to be characteristic of my life. 
So let's look and see what these unsaved fools have in their lives, what they're characterized by that we should try to avoid. So first thing we see, uh, they reject God. They reject God. Verse number four says, have the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread? They have not called upon God. Now, so first point there, they reject God. Now the parallel in chapter 14, the parallel verse just adds one word. They all do this. And, and that, that's the only difference. The only word that's different. And what he's saying is this. All of these unsafe people have these traits. So the first one in this verse is, have the workers of iniquity no knowledge. They have no knowledge. This word is that, that word that we know to, to, have, to know something by seeing it. And what God is saying here is, you know, they, they don't get it. They don't get it. Now, there's a lot implied in this phrase. Have the workers of iniquity, these people who practice sin, have they no knowledge? So the first thing we see that would be implied is there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity to have knowledge. And they've rejected it. They've pushed it aside. They've refused this knowledge. And it's also, when, when God says this, have they no knowledge, the idea, the, the again, implied in these word in this wording is it's a voluntary rejection it's not like they're like uh they have absolutely no ability to get it it's been there's been some type of revelation and they pushed it pushed it aside have they no knowledge don't they get it? and it's there's a there's the, the, the again the phrasing is such that it's saying well they should but they don't and they they don't get it they're voluntarily not getting it and that last thing, the workers of iniquity have no knowledge. They choose to practice the iniquity. They choose to practice wickedness rather than to pursue this knowledge. So the wickedness is what they want instead of this understanding of God. Now we know believers, unbelievers, it makes no difference when I say this. The flesh is strong. The flesh is a very powerful motivator it's a powerful foe it's, it's a tough thing that it's one of our enemies that you know we have to deal with and most people and, and, you know there are some that are going to say works but there are some people they don't desire to be happy they don't they 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 want to be miserable i haven't met too many of these okay most people they want to please themselves they want to be happy with their life they want to be satisfied in life so the mindset kind of goes like this if i'm going to be a follower of jesus i've got to give up a b and c and that's what makes me happy therefore i reject this cuz i got to give up this and and it gets back to what Luke talked about. I believe it was Luke 14. You better count the cost. Well, they're counting the cost and saying it's not worth it to me. That's what this, this, fool, this fool is doing, this description of it. They're desiring to, they, they don't want to give up what pleases them. They don't think it's worth it. So they would fall into this category. These workers of iniquities have no knowledge. Okay. We also see here they mock believers who eat up my people as they eat bread. So they mock believers because, they, because they've rejected this knowledge of God, they end up, and this, this word eat up, I'm gonna use a synonym for that, they attack. That's the idea with that word. Because they reject this knowledge of God, they attack those who profess a relationship with God. That's the eat up. Uh, I just lost my place. The people as they eat, my people as they eat bread. So why would they do that? Why do people, what, what, what would motivate an unsafe person to want to attack a follower of Jesus? How so? It would make them feel better. How so? You're, I agree with you. Right, right. If they can attack me, if they can attack a believer, it makes them right. If they can find, and, and, and we got to admit, there is places to attack. It is so easy to find our own 
inconsistencies. And people, and I've had this happen so many times, people are just looking for, what's the, uh, that phrase, cheeks in your armor? They're trying to find something where you've blown it. And we're there, okay? And, and you know, I, this is totally off subject. The best thing we can do is that what happens a lot is let's deny this, let's, let's go after another angle. But you know, you're right. They're right. We do have the inconsistencies. We are hypocrites too often. And to try to deny it, we're kind of like digging our own grave. But you know what? Yes, I, 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 do, I, do, I do fail. I sin. I get it. You're right. You know what? That's not the point. The point is I've got a Savior who died for me, and I've been reconciled, and we can go on. And then you start the gospel. That's the point. And that's what people end up rejecting. They end up rejecting. I mean, what we are is a representative of, of God as his children. And when, as they reject us, they can reject God. That's just, it, it's a natural consequence. It's a wrong one, but it, it's one reason why people can reject. So we, we see that um, they eat up my people as they eat bread. So what would this eating, that eating up would have the idea of the inconsistencies, trying to poke, poke holes, find find out our hypocritical attitudes to confirm their own belief. And uh, Pam, I think it's what you were just saying. They, they, they're looking for an excuse to say, you believers just don't have it. You, you don't have all the answers you think you do. And if they can find a way to, to shoot holes in our arguments or in the gospel, in that sense, it's shooting at us can keep them from having their, their, their guilt. And how many times have you heard a phrase like this? I'm as good as those Christians. They live just like I do. So why should I be like them? Why should I believe in their God when they do the same things I do? I have heard that, that, that kind of a phrase so many times. And absolutely. Absolutely. We are not living for those people. We need to live for our Lord. What's frustrating is when you're trying to witness to someone and they're pointing even at other believers. I know what they're like. I know what you Christians are like because I see this and it's, it's rough. Now, I'm not saying they're right. I'm, I'm disagreeing with their mentality 100% and, and, and I'll stand with that. But listen, they're going to be accountable for that. They will have to answer for these excuses they're making but let's you and I be really careful that we're not giving them ammunition. Listen, let's, 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 it, it, we need to make sure that, as, as Pete mentioned a minute ago, we need to be letting Jesus live through us. It's us being dead. You know, we are dead. It's us letting him live in us and not be doing our, you know, asking God to help us not to be giving them fuel for their fire. It's important. Yes, it definitely can. Okay, let's look at the last thing on this one, and we're going to stop with this point. But So they, they mock believers. They have no knowledge. They mock believers, and these aren't on your notes. These are just uh, extra things, but they won't call on him. That's that last phrase. They have not called upon God. Now, it seems logical, okay? If you're going to deny him, why would you call on him? If you're going to say he doesn't exist, then you know, you've rejected him. You're not going to call, but... It's almost like you could look at this and say, you know, the reason that they're rejecting God, the reason that they're rejecting God's people is because they haven't depended on him. They haven't seen that need to depend on. They're still depending on self. They haven't, and this is, this is required, they haven't died to self. It's still all about number one. And that really, that's, that's the height of sinful depravity is for is when a person and you and I have been there before salvation. It's for a person to not acknowledge and to give honor, to give homage, to give worship to the one who created and sustained them. That is the height of, of being you know, reprobate. 
the very one who keeps us alive to reject him and push him aside. And that is exactly what our world is full of today. We end up rejecting the one who is our only hope. He's the only thing that we can turn to, and we see this all over the place. I mean, uh, Jane was just mentioning with you know going to this conference with the, and Ken Ham's big thing, evolution, proof showing you know, this is a fallacy. This is just a it's a theory. It's what it's a man-made way to just try to reject God, and that's exactly what science is. Those type of science is doing today. They're pushing aside and say, you know, there is no God. They're fools. And that's what this whole passage so far is teaching us. And there's some that, you know, they'll teach, yeah, there's a God, but that God isn't personal. That God doesn't care about you. He just kind of set things in motion and let it all go on its own merry way. That's not our God. Our God is a loving God who, who is desiring to have relationship with us. So we see here, and what we're going to stop here with verse four, these God is looking and he's finding absolutely nothing. And, this, and that doesn't have the idea that God is, is confused or anything like that. He, there is none. That's the point. There's none that does good. All he's, all he's going to see as he looks down is those doing evil. But there's those of us who he's redeemed. And as we are in Christ, we can honor him and we can bring glory to him. And that needs to be our passion. Let's not fall into this trap, again, of practicing this practical atheism, like we're living our life as though God doesn't exist. He needs to, he needs to impact every single area of our lives. And if we're not allowing that, we're the ones at fault. And we're accountable for that. Okay. Okay. We're going to go ahead and close with this verse four. We'll pick up verse five next time. Any points before we close? Thank you for your input. It was good. Okay, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your goodness. Lord, I thank you that you love us. Lord, thank you for actively drawing us to yourself. Thank you for working in us and illuminating us. Lord, I thank you that you you. You sought us when we were rejecting you. Lord, you're a gracious God. Help us to be grateful to you. Lord, help us to remember you during the week and to actively and intentionally desire to live for you. I ask for your help, your power, your blessing on each one in here as we go out these doors. Lord, remind us often of what you've done and what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.